Oxford University Press. And the philosophy, uh, the director of the philosophy series, answered me very quickly by giving me a piece of advice. He said, no, that was impossible. Uh, I should write in the following way. I should take, well, big subjects like matter of mind. I should concentrate on a very restricted uh, subject and then engage with other philosophers, contemporary philosophers, that are written about the same. I should engage in this scholastic uh, game. No? In that case, he might consider uh, publishing something of mine. But uh, he's very well known. Uh, I can tell you the name. Peter Momchilov. Hmm. So, this is typical of uh, the, uh, the arrogance, the ignorance uh, of, of, of these people, this censor, he is a real censor. Of these censors, mm. of course, he never produced anything, he will never produce. Moreover, he feels entitled to prevent other people from producing interesting stuff uh, because he has the <clears throat> he has a vision of, of a blind man. He doesn't know what philosophy is. He doesn't know that philosophers have the uh, habit of putting this, this part of the things together, of relating things that at first sight are unrelated. Uh, he doesn't know what philosophy is. Oh, but, uh, they but, have but he is a great tremendous power. He is a gatekeeper, yeah. Yeah, the gatekeeper, exactly, the gatekeeper. To prevent New ideas. No, 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 but everything is quick, very quick, so there is no time to reflect, to give a second thought, or have second thoughts on something. No, it's uh, like all technological, all technological innovations have something positive and something negative. Mm -hmm. uh, then, I mean, one thing that uh, I found was very, was very useful. In, in what you presented was uh, the relationship of social science and social technology and the significance of the intervening factor of ideology, which, uh, uh, oh, it's, it's, it's like a very powerful filter that will only turn insights into technology that that suit a preconceived conception, even if that conception is is completely undermined by science yeah. and by the insights of. There's a very interesting example which is not very well known. That was the International Monetary Fund. The International Monetary Fund in Washington has two basic departments. One is a research department. And the other is a policy department. The research department is very good, very high level. A number of people who successfully got the Nobel Prize, like have been working there. They get good data, <coughs> and uh, they got they do interesting uh, research on trends, for instance, the effects of the so-called liberalization uh, on on the emergent economies and so on, but then the policy department, which is ideological, ideological there is no attention whatsoever to the findings of the research department. For instance, the research department finds that liberalization has been a disaster, has ruined most of the natural industries in uh, Latin America. But then the policy department insists on the neoliberal uh, point of view, which is, <coughs> as you know, was proclaimed from high up by Reagan and by Clinton and by the two Bushes and so on, that um, free, free trade is a solution to all the possible uh, social ills. And uh, regardless of what the research department so, in a reasonable, in a well organized society, uh, ideology is, and science uh, should come together. Ideology should use 
make use of the defining resources of, of the scientists. And the scientists should look at the sociological and uh, the to see what are the uh, problems of interest people and what are the basically political currents that either favor or block. But in a way, in a, in a strange way, that's what is happening. Many economists look at the ideo ideologues and the politicians yeah. and say, well, what do, they, what do they want? And then they supply basically uh, justifications, rationalizations with the veneer of science for what they want to do for ideological reasons. Yeah. So that's a coming together as well. But it's more of the kind that science and ideology came together in Marxism and Leninism, you know, where the science was <laughs> subordinate to the party's it's higher purposes. Also interesting, you know, the first Reagan presidency, uh, Reagan did not cut the budget of basic science, but made huge cuts in the social sciences because. Conservatives are not interested in that uh, people get to know what's happening in their societies uh, because that might be, might be <coughs> uh, fighting, might be very dangerous. For instance, it is well known that over the past 30 or 40 years, the Gini index that measures uh, income inequality has been rising from point to three. To 0.45 in the states and in Canada also, likewise. And this increase in inequality goes against the myth of American equality, the, the myth concocted by no less than Alexis de Tocqueville, because he emphasized the equality in America. He didn't, he didn't see this. Who was that? Alexis de Tocqueville. Oh, Tocqueville. Yeah, all, as the English say, Tocqueville. Uh -huh. uh, well, uh, and uh, so he didn't see slaves, he didn't see also the white uh, white uh, peasants, landless peasants, uh, who, of course, not being owners, but not entitled to vote. He didn't see the inequality. In, in all respects, but he, he, he saw, he contrasted the quality that he saw in the big class in the uh, upper classes with the, uh, with the French aristocracy and so on. But in any case, uh, to come back, uh, the fact is that uh, America that was famous for its social mobility is now famous for the lack of mobility, of social mobility, as far as fact that the <coughs> social inequalities, instead of diminishing, are increasing. And uh, the fact also that the economy has changed completely over the past uh, 10 to 30 years. Now the finance sector is the most important. It, it covers something like two thirds of the economy. And America has ceased to produce useful things. Only recently, uh, uh, President Obama remarked on that. that. He wants to go back to the time when the Americans produced things that they would export to the worldwide. Well, this is so far wishful thinking. <coughs> because the fact is that he himself is probably wearing a Chinese made clothes and so on. Uh, but in any case, um, American society has changed enormously over the past, since the last war. Mm -hmm. And uh, very few people seem to have noticed that the entrepreneur, the, tip, the classical entrepreneur, the loaded by, by, by Schumpeter, has been replaced by the banker. Uh, by the manager of the hedge fund or things like that. These are the people who count now. These are the wealthiest people now. Not uh, the people, not the entrepreneurs who took risks and 
together with inventors who are really innovators in industry. Those people are of no interest whatsoever. But, <clears throat> and there's also a decline in education until recently the United States was a country with the highest rate of <clears throat> college students in the world. Now it's number nine. There are more college students, more people going to college in, in other countries than, than in the States. It used to be number one, and now it's not number one. Number one. And so that will be seen in all of the sectors of society. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, and the, and the top, uh, much of the top talent, both in universities but also in, in, in the private sector, are imported from other countries. Yeah. And not produced yeah. locally. Yeah. I mean, they are produced maybe at the PhD stage, or graduate students. Yeah. Almost half the graduate students at the big places like MIT are from outside America. Yeah. So, also, 40% uh, uh, of GDP is financial industry. Oh. Oh. <laughs> What are you ridiculous? <laughs> Two percent would be too much already. <laughs> yeah. And the same thing is happening in, in the third world, with the exception of India and China. Or over in some you know, the quality of science in China and in India is very it's very unequal. In some sectors they are doing very well and others they are not doing well. In particular, in philosophy, China is not producing any new and new original thoughts. Very purposely. Yeah, but that's even true for here, as yeah. you said earlier. Yeah. And they're, but they're investing a lot in 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 science yeah. and in, in, in universities in China. Yeah. But apparently, it's very good mathematics in China, and they good pay in theory. They are discovering the fossils in Peru. Uh, they are, uh, but uh, in neuroscience or in other branches and in the humanities, they are not, not doing that well. And this is particular, particular due to the power of Marxist and Leninist ideology. They still. <coughs> Marxism is still the official ideology in the universities, although <coughs> the country has long ceased to be socialized in many sense of the world. But still, the philosophy they learn has to be orthodox of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism. Well, it's very economistic, so it's, mm -hmm. it's very economistic, yeah. so it's useful well, for capitalism too. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, let's call it a, enough for today. Okay. <laughs>